All the latches and registers we have considered so far were static latches and registers. Let's now consider dynamic latches and registers. A static latch or a register is a latch or register in which the storage mechanism is positive feedback between two static CMOS inverters. However, there is another storage mechanism that we know exists from uh, dynamic CMOS gates, which is a capacitor. A simple capacitor with an open circuit on one of its plates will keep the charge on the plate indefinitely as long as there is no source of leakage. The fact that the capacitor can keep the charge means that it can preserve a value. The value of VDD or zero volt will be preserved, thus there will be memory. Now this allows us to use the capacitor as a storage mechanism and thus it can form the basis of latches and latches are the basis of registers. So let's first consider a dynamic latch. So it consists of a single transmission gate T1 and a single uh, static inverter I1. Um, the storage, the storage location here is the capacitance C. This capacitance is not a capacitance that we fabricate. It's a parasitic capacitance uh, that comes from the drain capacitances of the transmission gate and the gate capacitances of the inverter I1. So how is this a latch? When clock is equal to 1, transmission gate T1 is uh, transparent and it allows D to become Q. In this case, Q will become D bar, but that's okay. Still, uh, Q is taking the value of D somehow. Uh, when clock is equal to 0, uh, transmission gate T1 is off, and what we have is the capacitor C storing the last value of D that it has seen. So this is the last value of D and it's keeping it at the input of the inverter I1 and therefore Q is going to be equal to the last value of D that we saw. So when we are transparent, the, um, the value of Q is equal to D bar and when we are opaque, the value of, D, of Q is equal to uh, D old bar. So this is a latch that passes the value when clock is equal to 1 and stores when clock is equal to zero. This is an active high latch. Now, if we use two of these latches uh, in series with each other, one uh, as a master, another as a slave, and they have uh, opposite um, activity, then we can make a register. In this case, the master latch is uh, uh, active low and the slave latch is active high, giving us a positive edge triggered register. So uh, basically what's happening here is that when clock is equal to zero, uh, T1 is on, allowing a QI to take the value of D bar. And when uh, clock is equal to one, T1 will be off, uh, separating D from Q, but allowing the last value of, Q, uh, of QI we saw to be passed to Q through transmission gate T2. As in the static latch, we do not ever have a direct path between D and Q. For D to pass to Q, it first has to pass from D to QI, and then from QI to Q. D is able to pass to QI in the zero phase of the clock, and QI is able to pass to Q in the one phase of the clock. A zero phase followed by a one phase is a positive edge, and thus this is a positive edge triggered register. If we look at this register, how is it better and how is it worse than the static register we saw in the previous video? Uh, so. First of all, it's much smaller. So the register consists of two transmission gates and two static inverters. The static register, on the other hand, consisted of, um, of six static inverters and four transmission gates. So this is a much more compact register. It's a much smaller register. Uh, dynamic circuits in general are uh, smaller than their static counterparts. We have already seen dynamic logic as opposed to static logic, combinational logic that is, and we saw that dynamic CMOS gates were smaller than their static counterparts. Uh, how else is it good? We will see shortly that it is also faster. This is sometimes an advantage of dynamic circuits. How is it worse though? Um, it's worse because it suffers from all the signal integrity issues we discussed in static uh, in the dynamic uh, CMOS. Um, particularly in this case, we are afraid of leakage of charge from uh, the capacitor C when we are in storage mode. There will always be leakage current that will take away charge from this capacitor 
and therefore we cannot leave this capacitor without refreshing its value for too long. However, for registers and batches, this is usually safe. It's usually safe to assume that we will refresh often because uh, the register and the latch will always refresh their values at every clock edge. So in, on every clock cycle, the input will be refreshed. Now let's calculate the uh, uh, setup time, TCQ and T hold for the dynamic register. Uh, the definition of setup time was the amount of time before the active edge that D has to stabilize. So in the static latch that necessitated that we let the input settle in the master latch before transmission gate T1 closed. This is again the situation here. When, when clock goes up to 1, what's going to happen is the transmission gate T1 will cut D from the rest of the circuit. And so we must be sure that the value of D we want to register, which is this value, is stable before the edge long enough to allow the value to be latched in the master latch. Now, in the dynamic latch, it's enough for the uh, for, the, for D to pass through transmission gate 1. If we can make sure that D has passed through transmission gate 1, then we are sure that uh, the master latch will latch the correct value of D. There is no feedback path to, uh, uh, to ensure that D has gone through. And so T setup is just T transmission gate 1. Why do we not include T inverter 1? Again, because the definition of setup time is the minimum amount of time we have to uh, stabilize D before the active edge. So it's the minimum time. That's the minimum time. This is just enough. We don't need to wait any longer. And so this is T setup. Now, what is TCQ? If we obey T setup, then data is stable at the input of inverter one when the active edge comes. As soon as the active edge comes and we go to the one phase of the clock, how long does it take for data to appear on Q? Data has to pass through transmission uh, gate T2, through inverter 1, and through inverter 2. And so data is ready at the input of inverter 1, and it has to travel all the way to Q. So it's the summation of these three uh, delays. Now, what is hold time? Again, if the clock is perfect, as with the static latch, hold time will be zero. Because as soon as the active edge comes, transmission gate 1 disconnects D from the rest of the circuit, and thus there is no need to preserve the value of D. However, if there is a 1-1 one -one overlap, then T1 fails to close as long as clock bar remains at 1, because clock bar should have gone to 0, but it refuses to, and it remains for a duration of 1-1 one -one overlap, it remains at 1. This causes the end MOS of transmission gate T1 to allow D to cross into the latch. Now, this is dangerous because it could lead to new values of D seeping into the master latch and we, should, we could see changes that we don't want. So T hold is going to have to be T11 overlap to guarantee that any changes in D that happen after the active edge do not seep into the master latch. Now, also on the negative edge of the clock, on the inactive edge of the clock, there is zero, zero overlap. This zero, zero overlap causes transmission gate T2 to be open through its PMOS longer than it should have been because it should cl close immediately, but it refuses to until clock bar manages to rise up back to one. So we are afraid that changes on D that happen after the inactive edge can actually go through transmission gate T2 before it manages to close. So we have to guarantee that T00 overlap is um, is smaller than the summation of T transmission gate 1 and T inverter 1 and T transmission gate 2. If we can guarantee this, then there's not enough time for data to race through the master latch and the transmission gate of the slave latch before that transmission gate closes. Note that this condition is less uh, permissive than the similar condition we saw for the static latch, which means that dynamic latches are more prone to racing, which is an issue we have with them. Uh, there's a question about uh, dynamic latches, which we, which we should answer, which is, why do we need to use the inverters? Why not use inverters I1 and I2? Inverters I1 and I2, the inverter in the uh, latch, the static inverter, provides drive. It allows 
the uh, inverter, it allows the latch to uh, have delay that is driven by this register. So imagine that you have uh, a bunch of latches, one following the other, consisting of inverters and uh, transmission gates. What's going to be the delay, the total delay through this chain? So it's going to be transmission gate T1 plus transmission gate I1 and so on, right? So we calculate the delay of each block individually because what's happening is that we have the resistance of this transmission gate and then the input capacitance of this inverter and then that's it that's an open circuit and then we have the resistance of this guy and then the capacitance of of the input and so on right we have a bunch of independent sections for, for we can calculate the delay for each of which and then add or sum them up if we only had transmission gates in series without intervening um, uh, inverters, then what we would be dealing with is the resistance of all of these transmission gates in series, but there's also a capacitance at each of these nodes from the drains of the transmission gates. And so we would be dealing with an RC ladder of this form. The delay of an RC ladder grows quadratically with the number of sections. And so if we use inverters, the delay of a bunch of latches connected back to back grows linearly with the number of latches, if we do not use the inverters, the delay grows quadratically with the number of inverters, with the number of latches, and that's uh, devastating. That's not acceptable.